Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The following program is brought to you by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a philanthropy serving society through biomedical research and science education. From the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the 2006 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Potent Biology, Stem Cells, Cloning, and Regeneration, will be given by Dr. Douglas Melton, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Harvard University and Dr. Nadia Rosenthal, Senior Scientist at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. The fourth lecture is titled, Stem Cells and the End of Aging. And now to introduce our program, the President of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Cech. Welcome to the final presentation in this year's Holiday Lecture Series on Stem Cells. You may have noticed a common thread running through these lectures. The tools and findings of basic research provide a powerful springboard for medical advancement. Doug Melton's love of developmental biology is leading to better understanding and hopefully new treatments of diabetes. Nadia Rosenthal's commitment to understanding muscle is leading her towards breakthroughs in preventing and treating heart attacks and discoveries made in mice are being used to translate to strategies for human therapy much more quickly than ever before. In this talk, Nadia will extend our thinking about stem cells and regeneration to include how stem cells may play a role in reversing the project, pro, process of aging and perhaps even extending lifespan. And now a brief video to introduce Nadia. As a child, I really was just a naturalist. And so we spent a lot of time just foraging around and essentially looking into rock pools and having a good time. But I didn't think of myself as a scientist at the time. In fact, my parents are from the theater. So if anything, I was considered a budding artist because I liked to draw. And I think my parents were quite astounded that I might take on something as bizarre for them as a biology career. So, in this case, it was the opposite. Why don't you become a sculptor? Why don't you become an artist? And instead I said, no, I want to be a biologist. Okay. No, no, <laughs> let's see, what are we doing? There's something exciting and almost obsessive about being a scientist. There's never an end to the questions you can ask. And I see absolutely no distinction in my students between that bug being caught by men or women. It's absolutely equal. And I am convinced that this is merely a question of teaching women how to be competitive and how to ask for what they need to get their science done. What's really great about having stuck it out this long in science with that initial uh, passion still intact is that our lab is actually now able to answer some limited questions about how organisms form. And I'm absolutely secure that the next generation of scientists, the young students and postdocs in my lab, are going to be the ones who will really be able to unravel that in a way that will satisfy what I was looking for, namely a quantitative way to approach the uh, somehow intangible nature of beauty and pattern and form. And I think that this is the, probably going to be the reason that I want to work on aging research, because I want to stick around long enough to see that happen. Well, buongiorno again. Today we're going to follow some of the themes that we started hearing about in Doug's lecture about degenerative diseases 
that often affect the aged and how these diseases are in some cases uh, diseases that we could model or perhaps even treat with stem cells. Today I'm going to focus on not the diseases that are associated with aging, but the actual aging process itself. So we're all getting old, that's the bad news. Um, and what's worse, if you look on the left at some of the attributes of youth, robust organs, high tissue turnover, wounds healing very rapidly with less inflammation associated with that healing and less scarring. All of those youthful attributes are somehow blunted and compromised as we get older. So on the right, the old gentleman, this wonderful drawing of Leonardo da Vinci showing youth and age facing each other, the older man is uh, compromised, frailer organs, lower tissue turnover, wounds healing more slowly. And when they are wounded, older people tend to heal less well so that inflammation sets in and scarring can often compromise the function of the tissues and organs. So the question is, how much can stem cells actually address these natural but rather alarming side effects of getting older? Let's have a look at how stem cells might contribute to different tissue types because different tissue types actually age at different rates. So if we consider tissues in different categories according to their capacity to turn over at the top, high cell turnover, high regenerative potential, they include blood cells. We've heard a lot about those, gut epithelium and the epidermis. And that's because, we believe, there are abundant stem cells associated with those tissues. Now in the medium category, we see such tissues as liver, which can actually regenerate quite well, and skeletal muscle, less so. But it's better than some of the lower regenerating tissues, such as the brain, the kidney, or the heart, about which we'll hear about later. And in each case, the capacity for regeneration appears to at least roughly track with the contribution of stem cells. So how could it be that stem cells have an effect on aging? Maybe they're just tracking with aging. Is it possible that they actually cause it? If so, there are a few different ways in which we could imagine this could occur. One would be that we simply have less stem cells as we get older. Or perhaps we have the same number, but they're less good at doing what they normally do. Or perhaps the environment in which they find themselves in our aging bodies has shifted so that they're all right, but where they are is not. So let's look at each of these possibilities and see whether there is any truth to them. The first question is whether there are less stem cells as we grow older. And to look at this question, we're going to look at a particular tissue type, which I particularly like to work on, skeletal muscle, which is sort of in the middle of the road. There are stem cells, those tissue cells we talked about yesterday, the satellite cells. But the question is, are there the same number of satellite cells as the muscle ages? Now, I'd have to say one thing about muscle. You all know that we can change the size of our muscle rather voluntarily by going to the gym or by working out in other ways. And in fact, muscle is one of the most marvelously responsive tissues in that sense. And yet at the same time, as we grow older, no matter how much we work out, no matter how much that master athlete runs, we end up losing up to a third of the muscle mass in our bodies by the time we're 75 or 80 years old. And that really leads to a lot of problems in society. Older people are frailer, they tend to fall, and then their bones are brittle, so they tend to break. And in general, it's an enormous cost to society, but it's also a real problem for quality of life as you grow older. So these aren't just trivial academic questions. These are questions that really could have an effect on society. So let's look at ha what happens when a muscle is injured and regenerates. As you know from my previous lectures, we've talked about these stem cells called satellite cells that sit within the muscle bed. They're normally quiescent, but when the muscle is injured, they're induced to proliferate by activating signals. And this allows them to produce more cells that can then replace the tissue that is damaged or lost. So that repair occurs 
and in fact the muscle is as good as new. So the question then is, does this um, effective replacement during aging um, change? And the answer is, it does. This graph shows the number of satellite cells in fibers in mice that are three to four months old out to 28 to 33 months old. Now for those of you who aren't mouse specialists, I can tell you that a 28 to 33 months old mouse is a real geriatric mouse, about 85 years old. That mouse is not moving fast. And if you see the number of satellite cells in their fibers, perhaps that's a clue why that is. So we can then conclude, at least for a mammal, that older muscle has fewer stem cells. And if that's the case, then perhaps we just can't replenish our muscles as effectively. But there's a bit of a conundrum in this, because in fact, if a muscle stem cell, a satellite cell, is removed from a young muscle fiber, as you see in the top panels, in the middle there is a little nucleus that's lit up to show that that is, in fact, a stem cell nucleus, not a regular muscle nucleus. If that muscle satellite cell is removed from the muscle and is put in a dish and allowed to proliferate slowly but surely, it will make muscle. And it doesn't do it any better or worse than an old satellite cell. So there's something about the capacity to make muscle that appears to be retained even though these cells are less in number. However, that's not the only thing that a satellite cell has to do. It has to actually respond to injury and it has to proliferate. So are there changes in the capacity of these satellite cells to do that job? And for this, we turn to a number of different well-known signaling mechanisms within the muscle system. In this case, we're going to talk about one such signaling mechanism that has actually been associated with aging because it declines an old muscle. And that's the notch delta signaling mechanism. So I'll tell you in detail how it works, but first, the reason that it was considered was it's required for proper formation of the first skeletal muscle in the embryo, and it's also important in regulating satellite cells in the adult. And it has been shown to decline an old muscle. So what is the notch delta signaling pathway? And could it be a clue to the decrease in the capacity for skeletal muscle to regenerate as we get older? So here's a picture of what notch delta looks like. Notch delta consists of two subunits. Both are membrane-associated proteins. Both have a little part of them that sticks outside of the cell and another part inside. Delta is in the top in the satellite cell in this particular picture, and notch is in the bottom. These are both receptors in the sense that they receive signals. And the way they do that is to interact. When they interact, there's a, a relay of events, which includes clipping the two sides of the dumbbell of notch apart so that that pink part, the intracellular part, can move to the nucleus and start transcription of RNA. So in that case, we have a way of telling the cell on the outside to do something on the inside. And that's exactly what signaling does. In a young muscle, after injury, we find a very robust increase in the number of delta molecules sitting on those satellite cells. And that is probably the reason why, in fact, satellite cells are so responsive to injury, because they increase the signaling, rev it up, and, and are able, therefore, to go into another proliferative round. And interestingly, in old muscle, that response is absent so that the delta increase doesn't show up. Now, in some real-life pictures from Tom Rando and his colleagues, here you see what muscle young and old looks like after it's been injured as it pertains to the notch delta signaling system. On the left is a young muscle that's been injured, and the injured fibers here are artificially lighted up in a sort of pink-yellow scheme. And you can see that the same injured cells are in the old, but there's a difference. No green. What's the green? Green is delta. So delta is being highly upregulated in the entire vicinity of the injury in a young animal, but somehow that response is absent in the old animal. Now, again, this is one of these observations where you could say, 
well, this is an obscure set of receptors that's interacting, and it changes during aging. How do we know it has any causation? Maybe it's just going along for the ride. Now, in order to, to test for that, scientists have to perturb the system. So we have to change something about notch delta signaling and see if that changes the way the muscle can regenerate. And that's exactly what Tom Rando and his colleagues did with some very clever tricks. First of all, I have to explain that there are ways in which you can inhibit the notch signaling pathway as well as increasing the notch signaling pathway. And I won't go into the details of how we do this, but just suffice it to say that if you treat a muscle with an inhibitor and you injure that muscle in a young animal, you see that in the top left panel, a normal muscle starts to uh, degenerate in a way that is much, much more uh, reminiscent of what an old muscle looks like if you inhibit notch. That is to say, if you compare the inhibition of notch in a young animal, it looks much more like the way an old animal responds to injury. That's in the lower left. Now, let's say we, in, in a complementary study, we activate notch. Can we actually turn an old muscle into a young muscle and its capacity to regenerate? And the answer is we can. So here you see that an old muscle is looking much, much more like a regular young muscle in its regenerative capacity. So these sorts of experiments begin to give us clues as to what molecular changes are going on during muscle aging and how we might intervene in those changes. Now, finally, I'd like to talk about the possibility that the stem cells have their own intrinsic problems during aging but the environment is aging as well. So the question here is, if we change the environment of an aging tissue, will the resident cells in that tissue respond in a different way? Let's look again at what happens in an injured muscle. In a young injured muscle, we have a very robust signal that seems to go through the entire muscle activating the satellite cells. It involves notch, it involves a lot of other things as well. And what that does, is produce, in the end, a proliferation of the stem cells. In the older muscle, a similar injury is capable of in, in activating those same uh, responses, but they're blunted in some way, as if there was some negative damping down of the response to regenerate. And in that case, what you see then is less satellite cells. So would it be possible that there is an environmental effect here on the way these satellite cells are responding and could there be some way that we could expose the young muscle to an old environment and the old muscle to a young environment. Now short of transplanting muscles from young animals into old animals, which doesn't really give you that much information, Tom Rando came up with a very ingenious scheme. In this case, he asked the question, where's the fountain of youth? Is the young animal capable of reprogramming old muscle to respond to injury in a more effective way? Or is it possible that the old animal, if exposed to um, a young environment, will actually in some way damp down the capacity for the young muscle to regenerate? To do this, he made parabiotic pairings between mice of different ages. Now how this works is a small suture is made in the side of the animal's skin. In both cases, in these pairs, they are sutured together as if they were mini Siamese twins. Not their whole body, but just a small portion of their body is connected. At this point, what happens is that the circulation of the two animals begins to run into each other. And eventually, after a couple of days of this, the animals actually share the same circulation. Now, they share the same blood cells, but they also share all of the factors that are floating around in the serum of your blood. And the question then can be asked, what happens if you injure the young animal or the old animal in these what we call heterochronic pairings or partners? So I'm going to show you a complicated slide which uh, gives the answer to this question. And although it's complicated, it has a, a real uh, dramatic punchline here. So let's go through it very quickly. We're going to look first at the capacity for a young mouse to sustain injury when exposed to a young mouse's environment. That's a control, because in fact we assume nothing's going to change. And in fact, if you see at the top, you're beginning now to be muscle experts, you can tell 
that that muscle there is actually regenerating pretty well. Now at the bottom, you see a stain for red, and red means new muscle forming. So where you see red on the lower panel, that means regeneration is occurring. So this is just a very easy way to see whether there are going to be changes. Now you see here that if you injure the young animal and the, the young animal is partnered with the old animal, it doesn't seem to affect the young animal. The young animal continues to be able to regenerate just as well. Now let's look at an old animal who is paired with another old animal. Again, another control which tells us that the actual procedure itself isn't changing anything about the way in which these animals can regenerate. The punchline is here. If the old animal is injured when paired with a young animal, it regains the capacity to regenerate its muscle. So that's pretty astounding. That means that there's something about the young animal's environment which is affecting the old animal. Okay, so the obvious answer you're all thinking, I'm sure, is, well, that's easy. They're just stem cells in the young animal that are going over into the old animal and doing the job. I mean, that's the obvious answer to this. So in order to test for this, um, we uh, looked in detail at the capacity for the young animal to actually both inactivate the, uh, activate the notch pathway and to deliver cells to the old animal. So first what we're going to see here is that in fact the notch pathway is activated in old animal cells if cultured in a dish with young animal serum. Now the serum does not have any cells in it. It's just the stuff that your blood, floats, your blood cells float around in. It's full of factors and those factors are capable of activating the notch pathway in the old stem cells. So that tells us that it's probably not cells. And here's just the data to suggest that that's the case. Here you're looking at young cells on the left with serum from young and old, same number of notch positive cells. The old cells that are exposed to either young or old serum either have less notch as we see in the previous slide, but they also have the capacity to activate notch with young serum. Now, finally, in a real proof of concept in the actual animal, you can mark the cells in the young animal by using a transgenic animal. And that allows you to follow the cells if they do move over at all. So the way we do this is to use a young animal that has a green fluorescent protein transgene in every one of its cells. And then we look in the old animal after injury and see whether in fact there are any green cells in that old animal. And the answer is there are not. So although the cells are moving around, those muscle cells are actually controlling the regeneration of the old animal's injury in response to young factors. So before we take questions then, we'll just review what we've seen so far. We can attribute some of the de uh, decrement in function in aging to decreased number of cells, at least in skeletal muscle. Those cells don't work as well and the environment in which they find themselves is not as conducive. So probably what we're looking at here is a mixture of different factors. Lower stem cells, worse environment. And we're now poised in the field to ask the questions, if we change the environment, can we change the number of stem cells? Can we actually rejuvenate ourselves if we understand more about the fountain of youth, the famous fountain of youth, which appears to be floating around in all of your bloodstreams and less so in mine. So. <laughs> Obviously, we'd love to know what are those factors, and now we're in a wonderful position to be able to answer that question with a systematic approach. We have a test, and we have a question in which we can couch that test. So finally, then we can ask the question for our next part of the talk, are there factors that we already know about that could perhaps be some of these candidate factors, and are there ways in which we can improve both the capacity to regenerate our own tissues, but also perhaps to improve the capacity for stem cell therapy to work better in older people. And I'll stop there and I'll take questions. Yes.
I was wondering how um, muscle fibers actually know if they're injured or not in, in a molecular sense. Well, that's a very good question. And um, the problem is, is that this is um, a field that I love, and so you're going to have to stop me from warbling on. And therefore, what I'm going to say in a very short, uh, hopefully succinct answer is that there is a mechanical um, uh, effect on muscle, which is to literally destroy cells. And when cells are burst apart, there is an immediate response in the surrounding tissue of any organ. Um, and what happens, among other things, is that signals are sent out from that injured area to call in um, important other cells from the bloodstream, such as the inflammatory cells, the cells that might be there who need to actually clean up the mess to take away the dead cells and make sure that those dead cells are appropriately degraded, and to couch, if this is a surface wound, to somehow close it to keep it from getting infected. Each one of those populations of cells that comes into the area is a potent source of factors itself. So what we're trying to figure out now is what are the factors that are coming from the injured tissue versus what are the factors that are coming from the cells that are coming in to help clean up the mess? Just like that. <laughs> Concentration. Yes, I'm, I'm going to save this one for you. Right. Why is it that despite the lower amount of stem cell contribution, that the re amount of regeneration is the same? In which case? Like when, um, uh, in the chart, we had a decreasing triangle, decreasing amount of cell contribution. Oh, that's right. The, there's still high regeneration in the. Oh, high. I'm sorry. In that middle part, in yeah. those middle, yeah. in those middle tissues, yeah. um, we believe that those tissues have been somehow programmed to be able to regenerate because they're constantly in very heavy use. So, if you think about the two tissues that were mentioned, skeletal muscle and liver, that are in that. These are tissues that are not in high turnover mode. That is to say, they're not actually being sloughed off the way the intestine or the skin is. But they are also prone to injury. In the case of liver, it's because of toxins or waste products that could actually injure the cells. In the case of muscle, you actually injure your muscle when you go to the gym. That's why it's highly not recommended. But at any rate, you can actually feel no pain, no gain. That is injury. And that means that your muscle has to have a way to rejuvenate itself. However, we believe that in those cases, the amount of turnover is not as great as it is in things like the skin. And therefore, we're just in a sort of an intermediate stage. But this is somewhat of a hypothetical um, uh, gradation. And obviously, each, uh, each tissue type has a different way of doing this uh, repair process. OK? And this one's the easy one. Yes? Um, if we do happen to make the old muscle cells look young by changing their environment or by just changing or putting like young cells into the old cells, um, wouldn't it be like most likely that it would just relapse back into the way it was before we changed its environment just because cells are so just comfortable with their uh, beginning environment? Well, if in fact the argument is that the environment can change the cell, or perhaps the better way to say it is that the cell has no intrinsic reason not to be able to respond to the environment, not to be able to turn on its notch signaling pathway, or to proliferate in the way that it needs to do. Um, clearly, uh, the minute that we, so, uh, w that we so take out the stitches and separate those two mice, the old mouse will go back to being weak again. There's no question about it. So this is not a solution. Do not get any old person to allow you to <laughs> suture yourself to them. <laughs> <laughs> because you'd have to stay there for the rest of your life and you'd get old too and then it wouldn't work anymore. Okay. So basically um, we're looking to think about ways to use that proof of principle to isolate the molecules involved. Now those molecules might be things that we can actually deliver as therapeutics in a much more consistent and lengthy way to stave off some of the problems associated with aging. The lady with the dark jacket and the red scarf around her neck. Okay. Um, um, I've heard of a disease, um, I'm not sure what it's called, um, but it's where young kids get really, they age really fast. Mm -hmm. 
and um, but they like their their age is still the same and their personality is like it has really um, it's like still young, but um, don't they still keep their stem cells from like um, since they were young or do they also lose their mm. stem cells? That's a really good question and this is a, a very rare but extremely uh, distressing sort of disease called progeria in which there is premature aging and in fact um, the progeria. The progeria phenotype is one that has been actually modeled in animals, um, looking for ways in which to induce premature aging in a mouse to try to understand what it is about humans that, th with these, these afflictions that we can understand and perhaps cure. And um, it's a long and complex field and would be a wonderful uh, subject of another Howard Hughes lecture, but I'll leave it to say that um, we're basically at the point where we know a little bit about the disease, it's multifaceted and stem cells in certain cases are involved. So I think I'm afraid I've been told to move on to the second half of the lecture and so I'll obviously take more questions after that. So I'm going to finish this lecture series with a major challenge and that is to address the issue of how we might be able to regenerate an organ that we all depend on minute by minute, but that is one of the most intractable organs to regenerate in our entire body, and that's the heart. So the heart, of course, as you know, is a very complex organ that forms very early in development and continues to function throughout our lives. And yet if you find it on our chart here, you see that it is one of the lowest regenerating tissues in mammals and it has some of the lowest cell turnover outside of the brain. Now what is uh, the function of a heart? Well it's a pump and it pumps in two different ways. Seen here in the animation we're going to first look at the right ventricle atrium connection in which cells are being brought out of the low oxygen starved body and pumped into the lungs and if we look at the right hand side of the heart oxygen-rich cells are being brought out of the lungs and pumped back into the body. And if we look at the two sets of two chambers together, we see this marvelous coordination which allows us to take our blood out of our body and put it back into our body in a completely different oxygen state. So with that kind of extraordinarily important function, which goes on from the minute you start to be a human being somewhere in that embryogenic uh, gray zone when your heart starts to beat, till the day you die, that you can't miss a beat. Well, a few, but that's about all. And so that heart has to go on and on and on. And would you think that that would be the one place that would be full of stem cells? And yet, it's not. It's so bad that when people get heart attacks, which means a cessation of uh, the function of the heart due to an injury, it's often a lethal, eventually a lethal condition. So what is a heart attack? So I'm going to show you on this little, on this little model here. So that's about the size of a human heart. It's about the size of your fist. And the two chambers that we saw before are more or less here, the two big chambers that essentially drive your heart. And if you see how much muscle there is, it's a bulging muscle. I mean, it's essentially all muscle. It has to be because it's a pump. It's pumping and pumping. The only way that you can keep this heart in th this incredibly uh, ready state where it can give a beat every minute or every, well, give 60 beats a minute or whatever it is, <laughs> is if these veins and arteries called the coronary circulation are fully open and operating. So the heart not only pumps for the body, it pumps for itself. And the way it does so is to take a little bit of blood out of the highly oxygenated uh, blood that's coming through the aorta and divert it into its own muscle to hold that muscle in a state of eternal readiness to, to work. Now, if there is any problem with this circulation, you essentially deprive the heart muscle of oxygen. And as you know, without oxygen, tissues can't live. And so a heart attack is usually caused by a problem in 
one of your arteries. So assume that this is then one of your arteries running through your heart. This artery is probably my artery after having spent five years in Italy eating too much rich food. <laughs> Namely, all of this yellow stuff in here is called plaque. And it's a collection of cholesterol which builds up in the inner sides of your blood vessels over time. And this can be a genetic cause or it can be a lifestyle cause. But at some point during this period, there's the danger that some kind of a rupture can occur through some kind of a mechanical injury in that plaque and blood can flow out into your blood vessel that actually causes, because it's an injury, a clot. And that clot, to close the injury against the outside, which is in fact the blood vessel, can dislodge and get stuck in one of these descending arteries right here. And then what happens is that you see what we call an infarct. On the left here, you see the blocked artery has caused an area of damage, shown here as a sort of black smudge. What's going on there? The dying myocytes, shown in purple, are, of course, n not able to contract anymore. And the ones that are surviving around the side try to divide, but myocytes aren't very good at dividing. And what happens eventually is that the scar tends to actually grow. And the reason it grows is that the, the myocytes around the scar start to expand and become larger and hypertrophic because they have to still do the same job for the whole heart that that healthy part did. Yet those larger myocytes eventually get to the point where they can't get any bigger and yet the heart is still having to pump, at which point they actually end up dying. So what eventually happens is that this original, often rather minor injury that people don't even know happened, then turns into a major problem because the heart starts to fail. It cannot actually pump anymore. And then you have heart failure. Now, this is a really important problem in the Western world. And obviously, it's something that many people have considered as a prime target for therapy, and particularly stem cell therapy, because we are looking at a loss of tissue. That's exactly what a heart attack gives you. It gives you the loss of the myocardium. However, scientists, biologists, have noted for a long time that this incapacity for the mammalian heart to regenerate is, in fact, not something that it shares with some of the lower organisms. And here we see, again, regenerative capacity on the left and evolutionary scale on the right. And again, we see that some of our lower vertebrate cousins can do a much better job. So let's have a look at this, the fish. The fish is capable of regenerating its heart in the most remarkable way. And for that, we're going to see a video. Zebrafish, which any of you who are fish fanciers keep in the, in the fish tank, can get to be about two inches long. It's got a little heart with just two chambers, one atrium and one ventricle, and that pumps blood throughout the whole body past the gills, which are the equivalent of the lung in a fish. The heart is very muscular, just like our heart. Inside, there are very thick muscular walls that allow the heart to effectively pump throughout this very um, complex series of, of veins. Now, let's see what happens <clears throat> if we cut off the tip of the heart. Ouch. Ow. Don't worry. The fish <laughs> is OK. It's OK. The fish immediately closes up that wound. Within seconds, the clotting process starts up. Now, in our heart, what would happen is there'd be a big clot, and eventually that clot would essentially heal over, but nothing more would happen. But Ken Poss and his co-workers have recently noted that aside from the fact that there are cells within the zebrafish myocardium in the red muscle that can actually activate like satellite cells and start to divide to make new muscle, there's also this slowly proliferating, engulfing layer of single cells on the outside of the heart called the epicardium, which is um, a mad, really a magic layer of cells because it engulfs the whole scar area. And then, in a really remarkable series of events that recapitulate developmental biology of the heart, a series of growth factors, in this case a growth factor called fibroblast growth factor, is produced by the heart as it's regenerating. And this fibroblast growth factor, or FGF, docks into 
epicardial cells set on the edge of the heart and those epicardial cells with this signal know to march into the myocardium. So there they are, marching in. <laughs> now, the next thing they do, obviously now we're in a macroscopic picture, is a very important, absolutely fundamental part of, of making new muscle, which is to vascularize it. So with the new veins in there, the fish ends up with a brand new heart with new muscle, and not only new muscle, but all of the appropriate coronary vasculature to innervate it. And the fish can actually survive and swim away. So we can't do that. But boy, boy, would we like to be able to do that. I mean, I don't want my heart cut up, but if it ever happened, I'd like to be able to swim away like that. Now, what's the difference between fish and mammals, really, then? Well, let's just look at it from a very simplistic point of view. Hearts can regenerate with tissue replacement in a fish. Several different layers of cells seem to be involved. There seem to be stem cells within the myocardium, and then this magical layer that is the origin of the coronary vasculature in development for the heart seems to recapitulate that same program and become, again, capable of making new blood vessels. In the human, heart failure is caused by tissue loss and no replacement. So what are the possible ways that we could address this problem? Well, we could study the fish, and that's exactly what people are doing. What makes it so possible for a fish to be able to do this? But we can't wait as human beings to understand exactly what's happening in the fish. We'd like to be able to start treating the patients who are in the clinics right now. Can we replace heart cells to treat the disease? Well, this idea actually has its origins in some very intriguing observations early on in heart transplant medical practice. So in a transplant, a truly failed heart that can no longer work is removed and a healthy heart from a donor is put in its place. And you literally sew the veins and the, and the arteries onto the new heart and the new heart can function more or less as the old heart did. This is a very complex procedure, it's very expensive and it, the problem is there aren't that many hearts floating around to use for the many, many people who need them. Nevertheless, the fact is that when you put a heart into a foreign host, you can ask interesting questions about that heart. Does that heart get any cells from the host? Does it incorporate cells from its host? Now, if in fact the heart that was put into a patient comes from a female into a male patient, the male patient in each one of his cells has a Y chromosome that the whole heart that was transplanted does not. So scientists have probes that we can use to show whether a cell has a Y chromosome or not. And so we can actually then go into autopsy situations after the patient has eventually died and look at that transplanted heart that often was living in that patient, that female's heart was living in that male patient, could be for decades, and look to see whether there were any male cells that ended up in the female heart. And miraculously, there are quite a few. So this means that a normal functioning heart can actually pick up cells from its environment. So if that's the case, how is it doing it? Is it picking it up from neighboring vas vessels? Or is it picking it up from the bone marrow? Because of course the bone marrow is full of male cells and the blood's going through the female heart every day. We just don't know the answer to that, but it suggests that the heart is capable of picking up cells that are circulating. So with that encouraging piece of rather arcane information in hand, scientists have begun to think about how to take stem cells from a patient, namely bone marrow stem cells, from a patient that's healthy in their bone marrow but has a horrendously failed heart and see if they can actually help the patient that way. Now remember that these progenitor cells have to do two things that I showed you the zebrafish does effortlessly. Number one, they have to make new muscle cells, and number two, they have to be able to put blood vessels through that muscle to give it the appropriate oxygen. So I'm going to tell you a little bit now about where we stand with these sorts of trials because they're ongoing for patients that have had acute myocardial infarction, and these are uh, trials that are based entirely on bone marrow stem cells from the patient themselves going into themselves. So these are what we call autologous transplants. And uh, these can be uh, extracted from the patient's bone marrow and cultured, purified, 
depending on the protocol, some of the trials have used certain subsets of bone marrow cells called endothelial progenitor cells, or EPCs. Others have reasoned that muscle cells might be possibly useful, even though they're not heart, they contract, maybe they would work as well. And these cells are then introduced in various ways into the heart of the patient. Now, in the case of the left-hand protocol, there's an infusion balloon that runs through the aorta down into the patient's heart and delivers the cells that way. So catheterization of the circulation in human patients is something that is very, very well understood and is quite uh, routine. Alternatively, you can use needle injection with a catheter and a flexible needle so that you can actually put the cells into the myocardial wall, or you can just open up the patient's chest and jam the cells in, Pulp Fiction style. Now, <laughs> I'm going to tell you about one very recent trial that was just published about a month and a half ago in which that first method was used, intracoronary infusion. In this case, the patient was uh, acute myocardial infarction patient, heart attack recent patient, comes into the clinic and is chosen to go either into a placebo group or into the group that's going to get the cells. So what this means, and it's, it, these, these are very complicated trials to set up because you also have to blind all the people who are doing the trial to whether the patient is getting cells or just serum, just, you know, saline. Because you might be able to pick up all sorts of effects based on perception. And so you want to get rid of all of that. So these are now trials that are called double-blinded placebo-controlled trials. These trials mean that many patients come in. Some of them are secretly in a, in a placebo group. Some of them are secretly in the group that's going to get the cells. They're all treated as any patient should be treated for myocardial infarction, but there's just this added extra treatment. And then the question is, what happens? Now, this was a trial, a very large trial, and many patients were enrolled, and the results just came out. And the answer is encouraging on one level, but a little bit disappointing on another. As you see from the numbers here, patients that received the bone marrow got a 5.5% increase in their function as measured by ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood that is ejected out of your heart. So the better the ejection fraction, the stronger your heart is. Now, of course, some people rec recover spontaneously from heart attacks, and you can see that by the number of the placebo, which is 3%. So a 3% increase in the capacity for the heart to do better was what you would get anyway. Now, this is not going to cure anybody in the long haul. And so clearly, although it's a proof of principle that there is some effect, beneficial effect, we are far from the optimal protocol. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do. So what are the other ways in which we can address this? Maybe we can stimulate the heart itself to make new cells. And if that's the case, maybe that would help us to address the issue. So in our lab, we've tried a technique in mouse to see if that would work. And you're familiar with this story because of the IGF-1 growth factor treatment I told you about yesterday for muscular dystrophy. In this case, we tried the same trick, except we addressed the question of heart regeneration. To do this, we made a mouse that overexpressed this transgenic IGF-1 in the heart. And we did so by injecting a cardiac transgene into the heart of a mouse. And then we followed that mouse as the progeny developed that had the gene expressing this growth factor within the heart and looked to see whether we had any effect at all on the heart or whether these animals developed abnormally because we're putting a lot more of this growth factor into these mice and they have this growth factor from conception onwards. And miraculously, we found that the animals regulated very well. They saw the growth factor. They didn't seem to mind the growth factor. The only thing that we did see is that if you look at these pictures of mouse hearts as they get older, at two months of age, the mice had slightly larger hearts if they had IGF-1. But it was just a precocious growth to an adult stage because we found larger cells, which in this case was what we expected, but those cells never did anything other than get to the size they normally would be in a six-month-old mouse, and then the mouse seemed totally normal. So on one hand, we were very happy, and on the other hand, we wondered if we had just wasted our time. So we decided to try to mimic a myocardial infarction in a mouse. 
Now, mice actually don't like McDonald's. They don't eat rich food. It's really hard to get them to go into some sort of atherosclerosis. Um, they're not really fond of high cholesterol. They like carrots and like Doug. And they, um, therefore, ha you have to do something else. So what we do is we put a little string around the, or the coronary artery and tie it down a bit as if there was a clot in there. And that gives them the equivalent of a myocardial infarction as seen on the right. Now, we then can follow to see whether the animals that had the growth factor do better than the animals without. So on the left, you see a mouse heart that looks normal with a ventricle, the big left ventricle, in a cross section. And on the right, you see a control um, in which we opened up the mouse and gave it a myocardial infarction, closed it up and waited for a couple of months and then looked at it again. And you can see that this mouse has very nasty heart failure. That thin wall is exactly what patients look like after they've had a myocardial infarction and waited a long time. Now, a myocardial infarction, the same myocardial infarction technique on one of these animals that we had engineered to express the growth factor didn't appear to have the same response at all. And as you can see in the lower left-hand panel, there was a rather miraculous recovery. In fact, it reminded us, perhaps hopefully, of the way the zebrafish regenerates. And so we believe then that the way in which the growth factor works is somehow to retain some of the tricks of evolution that we've lost and go back to being able to regenerate the heart. And if you look at the actual cellular basis of this, I've done it as a cartoon here. On the left, you're familiar with this picture. It's a scar. It's, it's going to eventually cause problems for this mouse. On the right, we have brand new cells. We have a vessel going through it. And essentially, we're on our way to a complete recovery. Now, how could IGF-1 be helping? Well, one thing that we noticed is that IGF-1 overexpressing animals appeared to express a number of molecules that we associate with homing. And there are growth factors and all sorts of other ways in which we can find uh, tracks of cells that are preferentially drawn to regions of injury. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw, that these attractive molecules called chemokines were expressed at quite high levels in these animals. Finally, before I finish, I'd like to just mention a very, very new result, literally two weeks old. So I threw these slides together literally over the last two days to show them to you, because I think it's very exciting and it brings home a point that warms the cockles of my heart. And that is a, an experiment that was done by Paul Riley recently in which he tested the capacity for a molecule called thymosin beta-4, which is actually a molecule that helps cells rearrange their cytoskeleton, their shape, to help with the capacity for a mammalian mouse heart to regenerate. And what he found, in a word, was that injecting this molecule into the mouse's heart created a much better environment. In fact, it looked a bit like what happened when we overexpressed the IGF-1 gene. And when he looked in detail at how this actually occurred, it was uh, really astounding because the thymus in beta-4 was activating that epicardial layer just like the zebrafish does. And so it appeared that we were beginning to have a pathway here that we could actually start to imagine looks like a zebrafish regeneration pathway that we could artificially induce in a human heart. So we imagine that thymus in beta-4 might activate the epicardium to make new blood vessels. We know that FGF is another factor that we can deliver that might actually then turn those newly, f newly activated epicardial cells into cells that can actually make blood vessel cells, endothelial cells. And eventually then, hopefully, we can understand how with the IGF-1 gene, we might be able to build new, blood, uh, build new heart muscle itself. So in fact, we believe that there might be ways in which we could replace cells. We might be able to stimulate the heart to make new cells. And we can even keep it alive by improving the way in which the hearts revascularize their tissue using this rather amazingly reminiscent uh, uh, protocol that looks for all the world like a protocol that the zebrafish has used by definition. Anyway, just to finish off then, here are some of the ways in which 
cells might be used to cure heart disease. And in many ways, you can think of many organs standing in for this heart because the ideas are the same. The ideas come from the possibility for cells within the tissue itself to regenerate and how can we activate those. Cells that might be available that we're not even aware of within a tissue that could be cajoled into helping out. And finally, cells that might come in secreting different factors that could help us to uh, convince the heart that it actually could regenerate in a better way. Now, before I close and take questions, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge the fact that I have a rather extraordinary group of people to thank, which are my own lab. And I have to tell you that they're watching this from Italy. They called me yesterday and told me that I was a disgrace for the t-shirt episode. <laughs> and that if I didn't do better, I wasn't allowed back. But I mean, in all honesty, that they've been wonderful in letting me out of school for a couple of days to come and talk to you. And um, it's really a pleasure to have uh, young people in our laboratories who get as excited about science as we do. And I'd just like to acknowledge all those wonderful people in a rather salubrious environment in a small trattoria in Rome. And now I'll take questions. Yes. Um, with heart transplants, do blood types still play an important role in them? With heart transplants, blood types do play an important role. And in fact, uh, the capacity to, with, uh, to hold on to a transplanted heart is largely dependent on how well that heart is matched at a number of immune levels. So um, thanks all very much. And I'm going to now turn the podium over to Constra. Nadia, thanks for another great lecture. I want to thank everyone for a very successful holiday lecture series. Thanks to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute staff, to our production team, especially to you, the student audience, for all of your great questions. And let's have one more round of applause for our terrific speakers. Now, how, how about next year? Well, our topic for next year's holiday lecture series is HIV and the global AIDS epidemic. Hughes investigator Bruce Walker from Harvard Medical School will be joined by his colleague Bisola Ojikutu from South Africa. And they will present four lectures talking about how the AIDS epidemic got started, what the virus is like, how it became an epidemic, and what we can do in terms of prevention and treatment. So we hope to see all of you next year. Until then, have a great holiday season. This program was brought to you by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. For more information or to order DVDs of the lectures, go to www.holidaylectures.org/rc.